Hey everybody, welcome back. It's Navigation Part 2. But before we get into that, little fun fact. The Golden Globe race is back on, and as far as navigation goes, it's back to old school. Yes, the entrants are using the same or similar technology that Sir Robin Knox Johnston used in his 1968-1969 race. This solar race is a non-stop, unassisted east circumnavigation in boats pre-1988 and limited to the 32 to 36 foot range with full keels. They are racing without GPS or any self-steering systems. The race can be tracked live and we've left the link below in the description if you want to follow the action. So back to us. Entering the stretch of coastline and our GPS unit has failed us. We want to record and share our coordinates but we only have paper charts. We are going to use our compass to triangulate our location using recognizable features around us, which can be used as reference points on our chart. If we have a look at our position from above, we are viewing a terrain version of what our chart would look like. The chart, however, also shows contour lines for depth, as well as latitude and longitude grids. We are looking for three distinctive landmarks which can be viewed from the boat, as well as on the chart. These should be as far apart from each other as possible for more accurate results. We have chosen these two outcrops and island as our three reference points. While standing on board and away from any magnetic interference, we want to take bearings from our position to these points and record the readings. Our first point is at a heading at 74 degrees magnetic. The second bearing is recorded at 326 degrees magnetic. And our third and final bearing is 208 degrees magnetic. Now we need our chart and our navigation instruments. A reminder of our variation rules, explained in part 1. If variation is west, compass best. If variation is east, compass least. We also established in part 1 that our variation here is 3 degrees west. So our magnetic bearings should be 3 degrees more than our true bearings. By subtracting this 3 degrees from our magnetic bearings, we have new bearings that we can use on the chart. And these are 71 degrees, 323 degrees, and 205 degrees. Let's work on our first reference point. Placing a compass rose on the point with zero facing north, we draw the line of 71 degrees, which represents us looking at the outcrop. Theoretically then, if we took a bearing from the outcrop looking at the boat, it would be exact opposite or 180 degrees different. So adding 180 degrees to the 71 degrees gives us a bearing of 251 degrees. Now let's draw a line from our reference point at 251 degrees and onto our chart. Let's do the same with our second reference point. This time we have a bearing of 320 degrees from the boat. We can't add 180 to this as it would then be greater than a full 360 degrees. So we subtract it to give us 143 degrees from the point to the boat. Again, draw in this line on the chart and hopefully so far the two first lines should intersect. And now we move on to our third and final reference point. This time we have a bearing of 205 degrees. Again, if we add 180 to this, we go well over 360. So we're going to subtract 180 from 205 and get our new bearing from the point of the boat at 25 degrees. Let's go ahead and draw in this final line. You would be super lucky to get all three lines to intersect at the exact same point, and that's due to boat and body movements. But we should see a triangle. Our location is calculated at the center of this triangle. Now to work out our coordinates. Draw a horizontal line parallel to our chart lines to our latitude table on the side of the chart. When recording or sharing coordinates, we always use our latitude readings first. If we look at our table on the side of the chart, you can see we haven't quite hit the 6 degree line yet. 
and we are still just under the 50 minute mark on the table. Looking at this information, we can record our latitude as 05 degrees 49 minutes and what looks like half a minute, so 30 seconds. As the values of the chart are increasing northwards, this is a positive coordinate or will be marked as north of the equator. From our point on the chart, we now draw a vertical line perpendicular to our chart lines so we can check our longitude coordinates. This time round, we have not quite reached the 25 degree longitude line. So our position here will be 24 degrees, 28 minutes, and what looks like three quarters of a minute, so 45 seconds. As our values are increasing to the east, this will also be a positive coordinate or marked as an east longitude. To use this method effectively, we will need to stop to take our bearings. If we move on from our original coordinates and want to keep track of our movements while under motor or sail, we need a different method to keep track of our location. Here we use a method known as dead reckoning and we'll do this using the information that we do have. This is not exact or extremely accurate, but it's what we rely on if we cannot do a further triangular reference calculation. So what is the information that we do have? Our boat's compass will tell us in what direction we are headed, in this case 28 degrees. Deduct our usual west variation of 3 degrees gives us a true heading of 25 degrees. We also know our average speed and for how long we have been moving. In this case our boat speed shows 5 knots and we calculate our dead reckoning after 1 hour. Now let's head back to the charts. Draw a line from our starting point at 25 degrees. We traveled at 5 knots for 1 hour, so a total distance of 5 nautical miles. Use the dividers to measure 5 minutes of latitude, as we know each minute of latitude equals 1 nautical mile. Place the dividers on the line and we have a rough estimate of where we are on the chart. We need to calculate these dead reckonings on a regular basis and each time we change heading to try to get the positions as accurately as possible. This type of navigation is done on long ocean passages with locations updated when taking sights with a sextant is not always possible. What we haven't yet taken into account, and this is something which affects sailing and navigation in a big way is tides. In general, we can expect two low tides and two high tides in a day, depending on where we are and depending on the effect of the sun and the moon on the Earth's surface. This is taken over a 24-hour period, with each tide change just over six hours apart. The difference between low and high tide depends on the area as well as the effect of the mentioned planets. Each low and high tide is also not the same, and we should expect small differences. Tide information is area specific, and we can find this information in local publications, online, in almanacs, and even in advanced weather forecasting systems. When we read this information, we can expect four tide values. First, the time of our first low tide, as well as the height above mean low water springs, which we'll come to again in a bit. This will be followed by the time of our first high tide, again with the water level value. Just over six hours later, we can experience our next low tide, again with the level expected, and lastly our final high tide for this period and its accompanied water level. The difference in water levels between low and high tide are greatly affected by the phases of the moon, so we need to take note of which phase the moon is currently in. At full moon, for example, we can expect greater differences in tides, which cause greater currents. Tides are important as we need to know at all times how much water is under our keel. Tides also give us an indication of what kind of currents we can expect. More water equals stronger currents.
The difference between our low tide and the following high tide can be calculated by subtracting the low value from the high value and is known as tidal range. In this example, we can calculate our tidal range at 0.86 meters, and this is quite average. Some areas in the world are known to have extreme tidal ranges of up to 4 or 5 meters. This brings us to the topic that confuses most students when it comes to working out tidal ranges, currents, and expected water levels. The dreaded rule of twelfths. Imagine that we have 12 barrels of water that need to move in between low and high tide. We know that the time it takes this water to flow to high tide is just over 6 hours, but this water does not move in a consistent flow, and is moving as follows. In the first hour, one barrel of water will flow, so not too much. In the second hour, two additional barrels will flow, so the water is moving a little faster now. During the third hour, three barrels will flow, and the same for the fourth hour, meaning that this is the most amount of water flowing, creating stronger currents. In the fifth hour, it starts to ease off, and again we have two barrels of flow, and finally during the last hour, we again see the last barrel of flow. The hour before and after low tide and the hour before and after high tides is when we experience the least water flow and therefore the weakest currents. This is known as slack tide. It's during slack tide when we expect our calmest conditions and will ensure we don't find ourselves on YouTube. Let's use as an example a tidal range of 1.2 meters. Divide this by our 12 barrels and we know how much each barrel represents, in this case 0.1 meters. According to the rule of twelfths, after the first hour one barrel would have flowed so our water level increases by 0.1 meters. The second hour increases by two barrels, so now we have a total of three barrels that have flowed, bringing us to a level of 0.3 meters. Now things really kick off, and after the third hour a further three barrels flow, which brings our total water flow up to 0.6 meters. This is repeated in the fourth hour, with an additional three barrels bringing us up to 0.9 meters. Then things ease off a bit and the next two barrels takes us up to 1.1 meters and during slack tide the last barrel flows which brings us to a total of 12 barrels and the water level up to our tidal range, in this case 1.2 meters. If we intend to maneuver through a particularly dodgy area, we might want to do this close to slack tide and if possible on a rising tide, so if we get stuck we still have water levels rising. If we attempt this on an ebbing tide, we will have to sit through the coming low tide and wait for the next high tide. Now back to mean low water springs. The level above mean low water springs is a comparison between two water levels and has nothing to do with depth. Depth in a particular area is known as chart datum and represented as lowest astronomical tide. By using these contours and the rule of twelves, we can estimate how much water to expect in certain areas due to the tidal range. Well, if you made it this far, thank you and well done. I'm going to go watch the race, take a bit of a break, and see you all next year. Have a good one.